Hi there, welcome back to the channel. Boy, oh boy, did the last two days uh, fill up my space. Oh my God. I realized that I do these uh, sessions for account setup, Zena setup, um, I think one every two every week. So I've had it like, this is my third one consecutive and it's uh, taking a toll on me. I was just rewatching um, the video from yesterday and I didn't necessarily, yeah, I wasn't happy with uh, how it turned out. I see the need to do some video editing, but uh, yeah, that's fine. Anyways, welcome back to the channel, Enough Whiting. My name is Dominic, I'm a Zendesk consultant. I've been one for the past eight years. I've been a Zendesk partner for the past two years, and I have been subcontracted by Zendesk to work on various projects amongst, uh, amongst them projects like this one, an account setup, which I am continuing the discussion today. So where we left off yesterday was we were discussing how to set up Zendesk in terms of ticketing. So we covered um, we covered quite a few points, which was the language settings, dynamic content, ticket fields, uh, ticket forms, and conditional fields. So we talk about the, all the, the theoretical stuff we from the slide deck. Then we moved into Zendesk to see how to do it. And yeah, I hope that was helpful. And today we're continuing that lesson because usually ticketing takes two lessons or two meetings. Today we're going to discuss views, macros, tags, and ticket settings. So in the spirit of following the same type of approach, we will be, I will be sharing my screen. I will walk you through the slide deck first and show you uh, the theoretical stuff, which you might also remember from your, from your training. Hopefully, if you've had your training, if you haven't, it's fine. Um, this is also a way to remind you how to do things, so no worries. Ideally, you do have your training and you do know what I'm talking about. But anyway, in uh, real life situations, you normally stop me, ask me questions, and uh, yeah, then I tell you, uh, yeah, I uh, fill in the gaps and then we can continue our discussion. So all good. So yeah, let's go on and I can share my screen. Uh, 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 so for those of you who don't, who haven't uh, checked this channel before, this is a continuation from yesterday's video as you've probably noticed. And um, yeah, if you haven't checked the video, check out the video from yesterday and this one will make a lot more sense. I know it's long, but yeah, there's a lot of valuable information squeezed into there because of yeah, all this, um, all the information that you have to keep in mind in order to have a successful Zenas is comprised into, yeah, in my view, short one hour and a half, one hour and 40 minute lessons. So let me share my screen and show you where we are. Let's do a quick recap. First, I'm going to show you my, okay, here we go. So this is where we are. Again, quick recap, we do first a discovery phase or a learn phase where we learn about you and your business. You have all this bunch of homework. Then we have some discovery session to discuss yeah, what your business processes look like and how we can translate those into customer service features inside Zendesk. Then we have design sessions where we go through a walkthrough of yeah, every business use case that we've collected up here. And then we have the people setup where we discuss everything around setting up your customers and your agents in your Zendesk. And then we have this one, which is ticketing, um, which is part two today. So we're just going to go ahead and put another checkbox. This, this is going to be done now. And afterwards follows the channel. So I, yeah, probably we're going to do obviously email guide or, or um, well, in guide it's going to be forms. And then we're going to cover chats and maybe API, but yeah, that's a little bit technical and I don't have a lot to show you because that's a lot of coding. So that's something which, uh, yeah, it doesn't, um, 
it's not for the it's not for the business side it's more for the technical side Alrighty, so back to our slide deck. So today, again, we're discussing first starting today's lesson with views. Okay, so views, um, as far as the design principles, um, we encourage, I encourage you to use a global set of views for scalability and workflow consistency by using uh, group is current users group. And uh, also you can take into consideration using um, current user. So whoever is logged in and looking at the ticket. Uh, and I will go over through what group is current users groups in uh, quite a bit. So um, the basic principle is to look at so the tickets that are assigned to me. So actionable tickets assigned to the current user who is, uh, yeah, whoever is, it is that is looking at Zendesk or opening Zendesk, right? So this is not necessarily aimed at me, rather anyone who is logged in as an agent inside Zendesk. Unassigned tickets, so actionable, actionable unassigned tickets within the current users groups, right? So if I'm an agent, I can be a member of multiple groups. So I'd want to ideally have um, uh, displayed all of the tickets that I could be uh, I could be required on to help solve requests and then teamwork actionable tickets assigned to other group members usually this can be also um, for smaller companies this can be all unsolved tickets within the company or within the uh, within Zendesk or teamwork yeah it can be also for for larger teams it can be yeah um, assigned to other uh, group members. So I can see what other teams are working on. This also depends if you need it. For example, for larger companies, uh, which have yeah, this uh, company that I worked with, it had uh, upwards of 100K tickets per month. So it would have been very confusing for agents to see the tickets that were, um, yeah, that other team members were handling and it's not just that it's confusing that but uh, imagine the human psyche is a little bit uh, a bit taken back or uh, it's overbearing to see so many unsolved tickets it can give some people anxiety so it's good to just limit the number of tickets that each agent sees to whatever they need to focus on and and if you remember from our previous lesson uh, when we discussed uh, user roles or um, agent roles in uh, in the people setup um, we we know that we have different uh, access to uh, the visibility to tickets. So some agents could just see maybe the tickets that were assigned to them, or ticket assigned to um, to the groups or organizations that they are members of. Then, for example, this is just to increase uh, productivity, maybe potentially for managers. So to see pending tickets. So pending tickets are tickets that are uh, we are waiting for a reply from the customer. This is optional because if you think about it. Right, so a pending ticket is when we set a ticket inside Zendesk uh, that we are expecting the customer to get back to us, right? So we put the ticket on pending when we're uh, reaching out and saying, hey, in order to help you solve your request, we need whatever information to help you. So this is optional in the sense that uh, we don't necessarily need to keep an eye out on tickets that we are waiting for a reply. Uh, from the customer because we can essentially create an automation so we can create a business rule that just uh, follows up automatically and says hey you haven't reached out you haven't gotten back to us and we were wondering if you maybe still need help if not maybe we will solve the ticket for you then on hold tickets uh, this is good to keep in mind because this uh, on hold this is going to be relevant when we discuss uh, service level agreements so on hold tickets um, is uh, when we are waiting for a reply from a third party. So uh, the ticket is still with us. It's still, the customer is still waiting for a reply from us while we're performing an internal action, right? So we, in order to solve the request, we either need to escalate to someone or we need to um, reach out to a partner to help us solve the request, right? Imagine that you're expecting some uh, a delivery and you're working with a partner company and you want to reach out to that partner company and ask hey is uh, where is the package are you about to arrive with the with it at the yeah the requester's door or what's going on give me an update so i can update the customer right so this is um this is what 
in short describes the on hold and it is um, it would be advisable to keep track of and then salt this is also optional but um, it, if you think about it so you, how you can think about it is um, in order to help your team be more proactive and uh, be able to find answers to their questions like for example um, you can use salt to a salt view to keep an eye on tickets that were re tickets that were recently solved by the team right so this way somebody who is doesn't have as much experience can go into the salt view and maybe see how some team members dealt with similar tickets right so they can be inspired they can uh, maybe copy some uh, yeah copy some information from there and then uh, help other customers in the same manner uh, and then, yeah, ensure consistent naming convention by adding team names before team specific views, right? So this is uh, this is true for larger larger teams. So you have to make sure that you keep everything, um, yeah, you keep everything very nicely um, named so that uh, nobody's confused as to what tickets they are looking at. If you want more information, you can go in. Sorry, you can go in and uh, read more information here on the Zenda support uh, website. So now um, what I would like to guide you through, I have another slide is uh, I have some design notes for previous uh, lessons about groups, right? So this is something which is very important for my view to keep in mind. So um, more groups equals agents only see appropriate tickets. I will show you what that looks like inside Zendesk, but if you think about it, you can create uh, potentially. So, for example, if you're uh, if you're using multi brands, right? So you're activating and uh, you need multiple brands in order to offer support. So you or maybe a, even you're activating in different countries. You can think about um, creating, for example, you have departments, different departments that uh, fill different functions in each country. So, for example, in one country, for example, in Germany, you can have um, a uh, product inquiry group or customer care group, you can have a uh, billing group, you can have a finance group, you can have a, um, I don't know, an escalation group maybe, or you can have, for example, if you, if you off, if you decide to have the approach of creating tier, tic, uh, tier groups, like different support tiers for your uh, customer service team, you can have, um, tier one Germany, tier two Germany, tier three Germany. And then you can have the same tier one uh, Italy, tier two Italy, tier three Italy. Uh, same for UK and whichever other country that you might offer, be offering support in, right? So in this, uh, in this particular scenario, you can, the more granular your groups are, the, um, the less views that you need to create. So now, if you have broader groups, this will encourage proliferate. I swear I know this word. <laughs> broader groups will encourage prol proliferation of custom views. So if you just have a group called Germany, a group called Italy, a group called UK, then it's too broad. And then you'll need to filter out tickets through the views um, by having custom views, right? So if you, um, if you keep in mind that you you have a limitation on how many views you can see uh, in your at least global views that you can see in the Zendesk interface, then it becomes a little bit cluttered. I've seen many, many situations, um, like actually most companies have this approach and they don't know this information is that they have broad groups and they have a lot of views. So, you know, um, as an agent, you can only see 12 views on your, on your Zendesk interface. And in that, uh, in that scenario, um, you cannot be displayed more. So again, most companies have upwards of 20, 30, 50. I've been in, in, in scenarios where customers had 150 views. Nobody had any idea where anything was. And that proved to be uh, very, very stressful because agents wouldn't, weren't able to conduct their daily, uh, their daily work routines. And that's uh, pretty unfortunate. So which views do you need to work with uh, tickets? So this is a very over oversimplified view, right? So a very oversimplified, let's say solution, but I have implemented it in uh, teams of upwards of 500 people uh, working inside Zenit. So it's a huge number and it worked 
pristinely. So it worked amazingly. So uh, my tickets, my unassigned tickets, unsold tickets in my groups. Ooh, sorry. And then um, this is what should be displayed on the view. So the subject, the requester, next SLA breach, when it was requested, type of ticket, priority, and obviously type of inquiry, the, what we've created yesterday, if you remember. So let's go in and let's see how this looks like in Zenda. So I am here in my home, my dashboard, but then again, this is my views. Okay, so let me describe a typical day uh, now that we got the theory out of the out of the way, let me describe a let's say an ideal day in the life of an agent. So, an agent comes to work. They grab their favorite drink, a coffee in the morning, and then what they do is the first thing they do is they go to my tickets, and they handle the most uh, urgent tickets within this list. Obviously, you would have to create a urgency queue. Right, so you'd have maybe um, maybe filtering out by the next SLA breach. So the um, urgency of the ticket is dictated by the next SLA breach. You can have it based on the priority. You can have it based in, on when it was requested, or maybe you have another column which is, for example, for VIP customers. So that's all dependent on you. In this case, I am um, I am uh, yeah. In this example, I am having everything grouped by the next SLA breach. So this is the order in which the agents have to go in and answer tickets. So after they've put everything on pending, right? So the, in their list, I have a lot of open tickets. So I have a lot of work to do, <laughs> right? So if the tickets are open, then it means that I, as an agent, I'm required to perform an action. So in this case, in this scenario, um, I have to go through my list and put everything on pending. After I have finished everything in my tickets, so everything that was assigned to me directly, because I want to have a good performance, so whichever ticket that is assigned to me has to be dealt with first. Then, after I finish this, I'm very pro, pro efficient, I go to the unassigned tickets. So, unassigned tickets um, that are uh, showing up in my groups. So I am a member, um, I'm a member, I could be a member of only one group and I can only see the tickets within that group, right? So I am handling uh, these tickets. Um, I am handling uh, everything in um, in my, my personal uh, view that I see my tickets. And then in unassigned tickets, I go and I pick tickets that are, have ended up in my group or my groups uh, inbox and I can go in, I can assign them to myself, I can assign it to different team members. If I'm a team leader, I can go in and I can um, I can spend most of my time in here and I can assign tickets to whoever I think is appropriate and whoever I know is experienced with a type of request or another. Then after I finish my unassigned tickets uh, queue and I've uh, assigned tickets, I've gotten back to users, I can go to unsolved tickets in my group. Oh, so my mouse isn't working again. So uh, I am going to make you a deal. So you fix this for me, I fix your Zendesk. Because <laughs> this is killing me. It's like it's doing this every 15 minutes uh, and it's doing it again. Thanks. Thanks for nothing. All right. So my uh, unsolved tickets in my groups. So this is, uh, as the name suggests, um, unsolved tickets in my groups is I can go in and after I finished uh, the responding to my tickets, after I've gone in and assigned tickets and replied to some of the tickets in there, um, and then I can go ahead and I can maybe help my team or my teams that I'm a member of, and I can go in here and pick tickets and solve, uh, yeah, well, help solving these tickets. In essence, I don't, so if you think about it, I don't necessarily need to be worried about any other seeing any other tickets. So I see everything that has been assigned to me. I can see what my team is working on. I can see what, uh, what unassigned tickets. So these are the also need to be uh, assigned very fast. And I can see what my team is working on as well. So in essence, I don't need to see anything else. Uh, I see suspended and deleted tickets because I'm an administrator right now with my account, but as an agent, I wouldn't be able to see those. So I would just have three views, right? So imagine that because you have the limitation of seeing 12 views as an agent, 14 as an administrator with these two, um, anything you add above that number 
is not going to be showing up in other in agents uh, list. So there's two ways of fixing this. One is allowing your agents to create personal views, right? So they can create uh, views that are they can use they can use in their regular day-to-day -day activities. Or um, another one is to uh, another solution is to obviously add more views in here because you have you have so much room, and um, this is what we will be doing now. So um, I am speaking right now from the perspective of a team leader. Uh, we've covered what would have been essential for an agent, and agents don't have to worry about anything else. Now, as a team leader, you do want to keep an eye out on, for example, the all unsolved tickets within the company maybe or within for example the groups that you are a member of or maybe the whole uh, yeah the whole customer service system so in this regard i can for example right now because we have covered this and why it would be useful to for example see pending tickets which you know what i don't believe in it so pending tickets you know if customers are waiting for us to go back to them fine um but we can keep it, but I'd much rather have that automated. And uh, yeah, so the automation is going to be something like, dear customer, are you sure you still need help? We've inquired to, for you to bring more information to us or to, yeah, to provide more information so we can help you. And then if the customer replies, the ticket goes back to open and guess what? Uh, this would go back to, for example, unsolved tickets uh, within my groups or in my tickets. So you don't really need it. But I want to create, for example, either this one or this one, just uh, just to yeah to show you how to do it. So let's go and create the unsolved. No, unhold. Let's let's create a, a view for un or on hold tickets. All right, so uh, let's go in Zendesk and now we can go in admin and then we can scroll. Oh my God, my mouse, my mouse, my freaking mouse. And then go to views. Okay, so I have the active and inactive, so I'm not going to go in inactive. I'm just going to create an, another view, which I am going to be very consistent with naming, and I'm going to call on hold tickets. I can uh, definitely give it a description if somebody else needs to see it, but from my view, if you th if you think about what you're building and why you're building it. You don't necessarily need a description because it can just, uh, yeah, the name would reflect that directly. So who has access to this? Is it any agent or is it agents in a specific group? Um, in this case, I'm going to just leave it for any agent or uh, only me. So this would be the case where I want to be productive and I want to see some special tickets um, that I normally work on when whichever time of the day or to which I provide, yeah, I have some standardized answers and want to go through them very fast. So that's not something in which I want to cover right now or delve in too much because each, everyone is different. So I leave this for any agent. So now we have some conditions and we need to, um, we need to either meet all of the conditions or just meet any of these conditions. So. Um, the difference between this is because is that the tickets that meet all of these conditions is, as the name suggests, if you add some conditions in here, they all have to be met in order to display tickets. And any, you would only have to uh, display. You would only have a selection of any of the conditions that you that you um, that you play around with. So let's go ahead and put in the all of these conditions so you put like ticket status because we want to see ticket status on hold right status now what i want what i want to what i can do here is i can have is is not less than greater than so let's put just is on hold just to prove a point all right so <laughs> status is on hold and then uh, what else do I want to see? I want to see tickets maybe that are 
Mm, maybe the tickets are on hold. And what else should I look at? I want to see tickets that are on hold and are on hold, but are only assigned to maybe my uh, group. Is current users group. So this is going to be, uh, this is going to give um, me the possibility as an agent to see the tickets that are on hold and are uh, in my groups, right? So we are going to follow the same type of logic because we don't want to see all the on hold tickets within the system. We just want to see it within the groups that I'm a member of. I'm a member of. And now let's see if we have any of these. Ah, all right. So we have a preview and then we have two results for two tickets that are on hold and our parts uh, are assigned to the groups that I'm a member of, I'm a member of. All right, cool, that's very nice. So what do I want to see? Um, satisfaction, no, uh, because usually, for example, satisfaction is, um, is addressed to sometime later in the process, like once the ticket is being solved and you send a customer satisfaction, then and then the customer gives you a satisfaction, um, you'd be able to see it. But in this case, the ticket is still is still not solved, so you don't want to see satisfaction. Preferably, maybe you have a separate view that you see customer satisfaction in, right? So you keep it um, for to to add at a later point. And it's not going to be something that we're going to be focusing on right now. So I do want to see the subject of that uh, ticket. I want to see who the requester is. I want to see when it was requested. Maybe, yes, I do want to see the assignee of that ticket. So this, um, this are all, these are all columns that I can uh, essentially um, be able to filter, right? So I'm going to show you what this looks like in a bit. I'm going to leave it like that because I want to show you what it looks like. And then I want to go back and edit it and add some more conditions. So let's uh, go, uh, go a little bit lower and talk about grouping. So grouping in this case, it has no grouping. Um, it can be by uh, ascending or descending order and I can group by whatever I want. I can group, for example, by uh, last updated by the assignee, but I'm not going to do that because I want to order by my next SLA update, next SLA breach. So I want to do this in a descending order by the next SLA breach. All right, so I have saved my, uh, um, I have saved my on hold uh, view, but what I want to do is I want to be consistent with the naming because I said that if I am looking at only the tickets in my groups, I want to make sure that I make that obvious in the naming. So I want to practice what I preach. On hold tickets in my groups. Save. All right, let's go back to our views or queues. All right, notice it hasn't appeared yet because I need to refresh my screen. And here we go. This doesn't look as nice and shiny as the other ones because this, these ones have uh, icons, have uh, emojis, which make them look a lot more fun. I, I really like using emojis um, when setting up views because it makes my day a little bit easier uh, when I work. So here's my newly created view, which looks pretty awesome to be honest, but it's missing something. What is it missing? Well it's definitely missing the next SLA breach column. So these are the columns the, for the formatting that we've looked at earlier, right? So I have subject, I have requester, I have when it was requested, and I have the assignee of that ticket. So let me go in and see what these other tickets have. So in my columns, so definitely has a next SLA breach. Let's see what this one has. Mm -hmm. So unassigned tickets has next SLA breach and also had a group, has a group priority. And okay, so I think this one is the most important and concluding, uh, at least for in, in what we're building right now. 
So what I want to see is definitely next SLA breached, next SLA breach. And I also want to see type of inquiry. Remember the field that we created yesterday? Well, we can very nicely add it as a column for sorting, right? And I can see all my, all my uh, potential uh, type of inquiry sorting in my column. So I am going to go into my view and I could go back to the cogwheel and admin and uh, edit my view, but there's another way of doing it. It's from this drop down here and I can export as a CSV, like the list of these, uh, these tickets, which I can potentially present to management or do whatever I want. It's um, the limitation is that you can only have uh, not all, not all that many. See, you have a uh, paid pagination, so you can only export so many, right? So if you have a large number of tickets, it coming per day or even per month, then this is not necessarily the, the most, pro, the most uh, lucrative. You can do, you can maybe work better with this in uh, Explorer. So we're going to go through that lesson sometime and some other time which is going to be uh, yeah, a few lessons uh, down the line. So I'm going to go to edit clone. Obviously it's just creating a copy of it. So I'm going to go to edit. And I'm going to go to my formatting options in here, right? So I can be able to see what I'm looking at uh, to see, to format, sorry, to format. What am I talking about? <laughs> uh, I'd be able to uh, filter by these columns. So uh, let me take the SLA breach. SLA breach, nice. And remember, I said that it would be nice to filter by type of inquiry. So any fields that I add in here in my Zendesk, I am able to also leverage in my views. Right, so this is very, very cool that I can, if, uh, yeah, if I add a custom field inside Zendes that we've, uh, we've gone over yesterday, I can also use it in my views so I can see what type of inquiry it is, right? It doesn't come out of the box Zendes, so that's why you need to add it. So type of inquiry, this is the field that we added yesterday. And remember, we only had two options. We had, what did we have? We had uh, order and we had billing. So let's see what this looks like now. We save it and we go back to our views and here we go. Next is silly breach and type of, type of inquiry. Now, neither of these tickets have the type of inquiry selected. Neither, neither of them have been categorized with either of the type of inquiry. So let's go in in one of these tickets and uh, form tenant. Okay, so uh, yeah, I can't do that right now, but what I can do is I can change my form to this one, the one that we added yesterday, if you remember, amazing form. And I can change my type of inquiry to, for example, order delivery issue. Yeah, and remember conditional fields, if it's an order and it's a delivery issue, we have an address to fill, irrelevant for this discussion, but it's just me, uh, yeah, uh, refreshing your memory. Okay, so now I go, I have to save this. And I go back to my view. And here we go, type of inquiry, order, delivery issue, right? Much easier to follow tickets this way. And also if you have an SLA on top of it, then you can also, you have already the uh, ordering by the SLA. So you'd see what is the most urgent in here and you'd be able to go in and uh, yeah, be careful to not to breach those SLAs and get back to your customers and keep everyone happy, including yourself. All right, I hope this, um, this made sense to you. Now, the next step is to definitely go into the workbook and to your views and add, start adding what views that you like to see. Right, so we do nothing without having this uh, this um, this file, this uh, Excel spreadsheet filled in with what we're working on. So it's very very neatly done, very neatly uh, named. So you can go in and keep everything orderly in an orderly fashion. Okay, cool. Next item on our list is macros. All right, cool. 
So let's talk about macros. So now it's your turn. Here we go. Macros. So macros, if you don't, if you're not familiar with them, these are template replies. So if, for example, you might remember this from your training, but if you don't, very quickly, it's a way for you to, um, to use the work that you do in a repetitive fashion to, to do it in a more organized fashion by creating macros. So these templates, essentially, they can be the text template, of course, right? That you probably have some types of requests that you, you more often than not use the same type of reply. So uh, it, you create these templates in the text, for example, that you go back, you get back to your customer with, but you can also modify ticket properties. And we're going to be creating a few for you uh, in, uh, in a bit. And then uh, I'm going to let your imagination run wild. So you can, yeah, you can do this uh, yourself and create template replies. I have a rule of thumb. Well, <laughs> I don't know how much of a thumb it is, but if you do something more than twice, just create a macro for it. It's it's much more, it's much easier. Of course, you have to keep in mind that um, you, as an agent, you can create personal macros. So um, as, an, as a team leader, you can create macros for yourself, but you can also create macros for the rest of the team. Um, obviously, you can allow everyone, like in your um, in your custom roles, you can create a role for agents to and allow the ability to create macros for themselves or globally for everyone, right? So I wouldn't necessarily provide the ability for <clears throat> everyone to create macros uh, globally on a on a global scale in in the whole of in all of the Zendesk. What am I saying? In all of in all of Zendesk. Um, so in your Zendesk account, of course. So. Uh, yeah, I'd uh, much rather you let your agents do create macros for themselves, and then a team leader create ma creates macros for um, yeah for other agents, and then um, this would be a lot more lucrative because you would keep things under control for a bit, because otherwise everything goes um, goes bananas and nobody keeps in mind um, naming conventions, so you can create a mess and also a categorization in place because you can categorize macros and have. And you have a yeah some uh, really nice ways of keeping everything organized and to make sense to everyone, even if, for example, they're accessing Zenas for the first time. All right. So design principles group will will have their own escalation and other workflow based macros as identified. All right. So you have to, um, you can create macros in much in the same way that you can create views as you've seen earlier. You can allow access to views um, either to everyone or to different groups, right? So you can, uh, you can uh, create some macros that are only available to certain types of groups or, uh, or only to a group or to certain types of groups. So yeah, keep in mind that you create escalations uh, based on, on each group, not necessarily uh, global, because it can get confusing. Then encourage uh, use of macros for housing uh, canned replies whenever possible, but may not be applicable, uh, applicable for all groups, right? So uh, some, some flows, some business flows, some, some flows in the customer service team are not the same, right? So some teams need access to some kinds of templates and other teams need, uh, maybe they don't at all, or they do need access to other types of templates. Starting off, uh, we would uh, recommend that only admins to be able to create and modify shared uh, macros. Agents will not be allowed to create personal macros. So. In this example, I say I, I recommend admins, but depending on the the um, the number that your team has, then it would be advisable to keep yeah to keep it in the hands of team leaders and administrators. Um, this is more most likely this is more likely aimed at smaller teams, but in my in my example, I'm bringing forth uh, yeah the ability for to the ability to create macros for larger teams which have a team leader. 
and admins only create uh, yeah personalized uh, flows and change flows and business uh, business rules and routing so a little bit more complex things uh, define who should be responsible for centralized management of macros it can also be decentralized to brands or business smes or managers so this is uh, again it can be tailored to however your business works i am in in no way um saying that you can there's only one way right way of doing things there's multiple ways of doing things so um so this can be um uh, however whenever you give out uh, for example permissions to to create um to make changes in your zanesk be mindful of who has uh, the ability to do so and keep a structure in place if you don't keep a structure then you're going to be having a mess and the downside of that of that is that mm, not many agents are going to be inclined to using the macros at all and then that's going to be counterproductive because it can really help in many cases and um, yeah if there's not a uh, organized fashion of creating macros in place then it can become confusing um, establish a process for requests. I I talked about this in um, in um, in a previous lesson as well. So a, a process in place is is key in this type of approach. Establishing an establish naming convention for the most common macros and use the cat categorization functionality to better search and classify them. I will show you how to do that in uh, in quite a bit in a few minutes use rich content in macros to enable the and enable the plain text check to make sure that text is readable regardless of the tool that the user uses to uh, check out the response right so it uh, depending on yeah who depending on what type of uh, yeah email inbox that the user is using sometimes it can cause it to look different than it would in uh, yeah in normal circumstances right so i use for example airmail and it does offer the possibility to see rich text, but some some people just uh, some people just uh, have a stripped down uh, email inbox and just displays text, which is um, which would be unfortunate for them to not see necessarily the the uh, yeah the the reply. More information on macros you can uh, find here in this uh, article that is uh, present on the Zendesk uh, Help Center. Or support center so now let's jump oh let's jump into zandesk why is this running <laughs> let's jump into zandesk and create some macros okay so um as per the views and as per everything else uh, everything is linked right here in the configuration workbook so you can go in here very quickly and yeah see macros you can add them in here and keep everything organized share this with everyone in your team so you have a centralized way of uh, yeah recording everything that that is being created in the system the reason why i sound like a broken record and i recommend this is because many of the projects that i do is uh, zendesk optimizations and zendesk optimizations imply me going in and untangling everything that it was done um, that led up to this uh, to uh, companies reaching out to a, a professional like myself and asking and asking them to um, declutter their Zendesk and uh, the lack of having this uh, let's say this documentation uh, of what is being added and yeah what is being added in Zendesk leads to this um, to needing help from a professional. So if you do this right from the very beginning, you're yeah you're very prone to save company money and uh, yeah be efficient so going back to zendesk now to start creating a macro so we go to admin as per usual and then we go to macros here we go macros i already have a list of macros so i have active and inactive so i have quite a f i don't have quite a few inactive so i have quite a few active macros and i can go in and uh i can add a macro but before i can also have some settings for my macros that i can okay so um this is just pretty basic so manual ordering or display for example 
um, agents most use macros, which is a very handy tool to see, for example, as an, as an agent, to see if you've used the same five macros and you can uh, just very uh, easily see them and activate them from your macro checklist. I will show you what that looks like. Display suggested macros, also very useful to suggest uh, the three best macros for the ticket to, based on your team's previous macro usage. It's kind of the same, uh, same thing. And then you also, this is a way for you to sort by the macros when they were created, updated, and the usage of these macros. All right, so let's go ahead and create a macro. So let's create a template for macros, for a macro, and let's do it for orders and delivery issue. So for the order delivery issue, I want to send a reply back to the customer and say, dear customer, delivery issues normally uh, normally come about when, for example, you need to have patience for and wait for a full two days, 48 hours for your product to arrive at your door. Otherwise, um, yeah, you're just being trying to be, uh, yeah, you're just not being following the procedure. And we encourage you to be patient, something along these lines. <laughs> this wording can be whatever you want, but uh, usually, um, so human psyche is when you order something, you want it to be, yeah, come at your door yeah, faster because Amazon has set the tone to be everything to arrive in one day with the prime feature. So uh, in this case, yeah, come customers become impatient and want to, to see, yeah, everything arrive at their door faster than, uh, than anything. All right. So let's go ahead and create a macro name. So this has to be transparent, not transparent. This has to be indicative of what it can do. So I believe, I firmly believe that if you do, if you have a, a good naming convention, then it is easy for people to understand what is being, uh, what is being used, uh, what it, the purpose of the macro is for. So let's call this one because we said we're going to get back to customers for order and delivery issue. So let's call this order and let's categorize it. So if you remember from uh, yesterday's lesson that we created that, um, that um, additional level for ticket, for example, for the, um, for the, custom fields to have when we created a drop down we have a drop down within a drop down so we have a multi level um, multi level or drop down or an accordion drop down and in this case we can do we follow the same naming convention and we do double colon double colon and this automatically creates that uh, additional level for order macro for example so order and then we call this delivery issue I can go even further and I can create another, um, yeah, another level. So for delivery issue, I can create another level. Depends on how many macros you have. So you can go, you can go as deep as you want. Uh, recommended is to have maximum three levels because then otherwise it becomes a little bit confusing. So in this case, I'm not going to go all the way. I'm going to go to just order delivery issue. I can give it a description of what it is. I want this to be available to agents in a specific group. So mouse not working. Again, somebody troubleshoots that. I fix your Zendesk, you fix my mouse. Here we go, it's back. So what group do I want this? Let's see, the German group, if you remember. Here we go, German group. And okay, so just agents in the group, German group, but I can go a step further and see what other, uh, Ah, here we go. I can add an additional group, so not just one, two. I want two, uh, two groups to have access to this macro. So I go to my actions. So the first things first, I want to add a text reply. So what do I want to do? I want to add a public reply to my customer and tell them, uh, yeah, give them this template reply that, hey, we're taking a bit of time to get back to you. Um, we're taking, uh, we need two days for the package to arrive. If two days haven't passed, then you can come back to us and yeah, give us a, give us a heads up. So let's go in and look for comments. It's a comment description or comment mode. So I have two. 
these are the ones that interest me. So common mode is what I want to do first because common mode asks me like, what is it? What is it? How do you want to display this message? Is this going to be public or private? I'm going to do public because I want to have a public reply sent to my customer. Then I go to comment description. Okay. And by default, as you can see, it's rich content. I have to include plain text feedback, <coughs> which I'm going to do. So let's go ahead and write a message to our customer telling them that <clears throat> they have to wait for 48 hours from the moment that they've uh, <clears throat> initiated their, um, their product request or product buy, from the moment that they bought the product until they can actually start getting worried and, uh, and uh, yeah, make it a priority for us to look into their issue. So let's go ahead and say, <clears throat> hi, dear customer. So because I don't want to uh, write dear customer to be so general, <clears throat> general, I want to be as personal as I want, right? I want to customer experience to be personalized and made um, yeah, as close to the heart of the customer as I can. So for this, we're going to use placeholders. Placeholders, if you remember from yesterday, are also used in dynamic content. But in this case, we use the placeholder like this. So we create the double parentheses, which accolades, I think. Yes. And we have these placeholders. So these placeholders are where a functionality from Zendesk, which holds dynamic information in it. So you can see, for example, ticket title, ticket description, ticket URL, ticket ID, et cetera, et cetera. So what I want to do is I want to look for ticket requester name or even be more personal and say ticket requester first name. So when the customer um, registers with us an account or yeah, they send in a, an email request, for example, um, Zenas picks up their name and we have their first name and their last name. So we can leverage that information to our advantage and improve the customer experience. So we can say ticket, no, ticket brand, no, due date, ticket account, ticket assignee, that's me, no, ticket assignee name, no, no, ticket requester name or ticket requester first name. So this dynamically takes the name of this end user or my customer, right? So this is very nifty and user friendly uh, well, I don't know how user friendly it is, but it's very, very much enhancing the customer experience because, um, and also it's enhancing the customer experience, but it's also enhancing the agent experience because agents don't have to look for the name and say, hi, copy paste the name and say, hi, Andrew, or whatever the name is. And each time have to do perform this action. Rather, we just leverage that information in these uh, placeholders, which dynamically holds customer information in them. Or in the case of dynamic content, it holds translation, dynamically changes translations depending on the language that is selected. So high ticket, uh, request your first name. Um, thank you for uh, sending in your request. <clears throat> Please bear in mind that we have a 48 hour delivery uh, delivery uh, scheduled for our products. Uh, if you have, uh, if the product has not reached you within that Time period. Please let us know, and we will investigate the issue further. Further, it's definitely not farther. Further for you. Kindly or kind regards. Now I can use, again, I can use the, um, the placeholders like this. I can use them here and put my name, like right? the assignee, so, or whoever's replying to the ticket. So let's do that. Ticket, um, ticket assignee, name, first name, last name, uh, first name, just to be, make it more personal, right? So I can do that. 
So what I want to do now is I want to add the same text in plain text as well. So to make sure that, uh, yeah, this gets sent across whichever in whichever situation, because um, this specific macro will use the email template that you use within your Zendesk, right? So if your Zendesk template is customized with your company's branding and yeah, it has or your company's colors, your fonts, everything, it will also carry over to uh, to this reply to the customer. So uh, this is why this extra step is needed because if you have images, for example, in your uh, in your Zendesk in your email Zendesk email template, which we'll be covering in another lesson, then yeah, this could end up uh, in spam. So it's just a precaution. <clears throat> okay. So what did we say we were going to do here? Common mode, public, common description. This is the text. Of course, you can add it in multi-language, so I'm not going to do that right now, but remember, we can create, what we have to do is create dynamic content for this text. We translate the text, and then we paste that uh, uh, placeholder directly in here. And yes, there you can have the placeholder within a placeholder, so you can put this in the dynamic content placeholder and, uh, and uh, translate the text, and it will work just fine. I'm not going to do that right now because it's uh, too time consuming and you already know how to create dynamic content and you can do this yourself. All right, so what I want to do is I want to modify the ticket properties. So what I want to do is I want to modify the ticket status and put it to pending. Why? Because, because I'm asking the customer for more information, right? So I am, well, I'm not asking for more information. I'm asking them to maybe let us know if it's been 48 hours. If it hasn't been 48 hours, then um, yes, it, we can maybe even solve the ticket. So, but now I'm just putting it on pending because I'm waiting for them to get back to me, tell me like it has been 48 hours. Uh, okay, so what else can I do here? Oh, now I know for sure that it's a delivery issue. So I can do is I can put my type of inquiry, yes, I can put it as a, delivery issue, right? So I, if has, this has not been categorized yet, I can do it with a macro and I don't have to do it by hand. So let's create this bad boy and see what it looks like. Mouse not working. <laughs> kills me, man. Alrighty, so now let's go to one of our tickets and see what that looks like. Okay, mine. All right, let's open a ticket. Uh, I remember the one from yesterday, and I think it was uh, ticket number three five two. Oh my God, why isn't this mouse working? It's such a pain in the ass. Okay, so this is my <clears throat> ticket from yesterday. And yes, this is the one from yesterday, if you're still familiar with it. All right, so this one is in my, uh, yeah, I can see it right now. And uh, okay, mouse back on. So, my ticket interface, right? So this is where I can access my macros from. Okay, so I have a bunch of macros in here. I don't necessarily, uh, I can't find mine. Why? It's because I have not refreshed my screen and I can do that right now. This way it will get uh, updated and I can see it. Alrighty, so I can go in, choose my macro list and I don't see it okay very good example and why I cannot see it is because I'm not a member of any of those groups right so that's the problem with uh, this setup that I've done right now that I cannot see the tickets uh, sorry I cannot see the macro unless I'm a member of any of those groups and I'm not so what is there to do I will make myself a member of those uh, groups. All right. 
So I said German group, close. Now I go back, I refresh my screen and I am I should be able to see the macros that I have just created. Alrighty, so here we go. Yeah, here we go. Order, remember, we created the order. We created a category for it, right? And we can see it in here. And here, delivery issue. So now I can preview it to see what's going to happen. So what is going to happen? I am going to have the status pending. I am going to have the type of inquiry to order delivery issue. And I'm going to have this as a public reply. And this is going to be my message. And you can see that uh, placeholder that I used with the ticket request of first name. And it has automatically taken the name, which is Dominic. So apply macro. And here we go. Here is the macro. So what I can do now, as you can see that my status has changed to pending. So I just click this. Here we go. And I have gotten back to my customer and I have let them know that uh, they should uh, just, uh, you know, calm their titties <laughs> because we will get back to them. All right, so that was the example with macros. I hope that uh, that was uh, helpful, and I encourage you right now to go into the um, yeah to the workbook and add your macros. Uh, which where is it? It's here somewhere. Here we go, macros, and add your macros in here, and uh, and afterwards go in and create them create them in your Zendesk. And yeah, and you kick ass. <laughs> One second, I'm going to pause for a quick second. And we're back. <laughs> and if anyone watches Seinfeld, I'm more like rewatching it right now. There's an episode with Kramer, and he's the talk show host. <laughs> and yeah, never mind. <laughs> All right, so continuing our discussion, we about ticketing we are going to discuss tags so let me share my screen so we can see the deck and then we go in zendesk and well actually we don't go in zendesk for this one but um what we want to keep in mind with tags is that we'd advisable would be to um, so tags, as you know, are words or strings that uh, notate some certain type of information about the ticket, and are, they're important for different purposes, but they, and they can also play uh, an important role in uh, managing workflows. So um, I've seen this happen one too many times where if you don't have a naming convention for your tags, then they get abused. and. Um, instead of helping you, they just become overbearing and there's too many of them and you can't really uh, keep up with the number of tags. So it would be advisable to not necessarily allow agents to create tags. So maybe you just create tag, tags as an administrator and that's it. And um, so you best advice is to prevent uh, users to from manually creating tags and reduce uh, free form tagging. So tags are applied consistently and are therefore meaningful, right? Because otherwise it just create a mess and it's no not useful because you can't rely on business rules, right? So if you have a business rule referencing a tag and then somebody creates another one, which is kind of the same, but you know it reflects something else. It's, yeah, it, it reflects the same thing, but it's written differently Then the system doesn't know what that is. And it's it's not clever like that and it will just ignore it and just create room for um, yeah for discrepancies in your system so uh, let me share my screen again another rule is to encourage macros first mentality for tagging needs and rely on ticket fields to apply tags right so i've shown you that if you for example use um ticket fields like drop downs, multi select and checkboxes, 
those apply tags themselves, right? So if you have an option in the drop down, that automatically gets flagged against the ticket as being, yeah, being relevant to that ticket, which is awesome. And that's the only thing you need, to be honest. You don't need any any other form of tagging. So, but of course, this all comes down to how your business is uh, created, and of course, you have freedom to do whatever you want. Just um, bringing out whatever what I think is important. Uh, tickets. Inherit user or organization tags for business rules. So, if uh, if you add a tag against a user profile or on a, uh, against an organization, and then that organization can have multiple users, um, each ticket that is created by someone in that organization carries over the tags from that organization, and of course, it inherits the tags from the user uh, profile that you've added uh, that you added uh, that you've added against the user. So. Uh, be mindful of the number of tags and what tags you add into the system. Um, you can hide the tag field or use tags only for business rules or integrations. Um, and the ticket categorization should be done through fields, not through anything else. So this is very, very important to keep in mind. And yeah, it will make things run smoother into your system. And I cannot stress enough how important it is to uh, keep an eye keep an eye out on tags and create business rules that are meaningful rather than uh, always relying on yeah putting out fires instead of uh, creating a proactive system so oh yeah here we go another very valuable lesson so be proactive instead of reactive right so be proactive create meaningful tags uh, don't allow everyone to create tags and reference those tags that you create one time and <clears throat> and reference those in business rules and be proactive instead of just uh, trying to update business rules according to what tags have been added into the system recently right very unproductive of course if you need more information about tags go read uh, on this uh, article that i have for you in here paul has for you here um and yeah and read more information so now it's your turn obviously this is where <laughs> where i'd ask you information about how you use tags and how uh, how you have in mind using them but uh, since you're not here what can we do <laughs> all right so now ticket settings um this is actually best if we if we go inside zendesk and we talk about it so how to how to go about ticket settings and i'll walk you through some of the meaning of the ticket settings so you are in the loop. Alrighty, so we have uh, two tabs here. So ticket settings and ticket sharing. I'm going to go over ticket sharing very fast because we can take it out of the way. So um, this is used to share ticket with different other systems and other Zendesk environments as well. So if you're offering support, for example, and um, for legal reasons, you are active in one Zendesk account, but you have another team working in another Zendesk account, you can uh, create sharing agreements within the be between these systems. You can also create with other systems. Keep in mind that uh, ticket sharing has um, has its limitations uh, because this has been worked on. It hasn't been worked on for a number of years. It has not been a priority for the Zendesk roadmap because some other more dynamic solutions have come about. This is still working and is still valid and it works well, but it has its limitations. So one limitation is, for example, the tags. If a ticket has some tags in the system, it won't ref get reflected in the other system. So if you change a status in one system, it doesn't get reflected in another system. So this is just send us to send us limitations. If, you, if you're trying to create this sharing agreement with other systems, like, oh boy. <laughs> anyway, this is very useful to some extent. Now, ticket settings. So uh, rich content or markdown recommended, not necessarily, I don't wouldn't recommend uh, changing it. So you can use, um, you can use uh, a number of formatting tools that uh, that uh, in enhance the user experience. So I'm just going to leave this in here, leave it as it is. Um, enable emoji emoji text replacements. Yeah, this is also fun to keep if you want to have a more engaging and energetic type of uh, communication with your clients. But depends if you're a big um, enterprise company and um, your values are being a little bit more um, a little bit more straightforward and not playful then yes don't keep it but otherwise i think that it's very cute <laughs> 
non-email conversations are public by default. So this, if enabled, um, it usually is um, is for, for example, to keep everything public by default, meaning that if a chat request comes in and you want your agents to reply to this, you'd want them to to do it with a public reply. So this can be and uh, this can be disabled, and then uh, but this would encourage agents to reply to customers to not reply to customers. I apologize. This would encourage agents to not reply to customers directly, rather just to put an internal note. And we don't want that. We want uh, we want to. Uh, agents to deal with customer requests directly. We don't want them to add internal notes. So um, agents comments via email are public by default. This is the follows the same type of um, type of law. It, it follows into the same logic as uh, as uh, the other um, at the other point above. So we want to encourage agents to reply to the customer directly, not to uh, put in public. Uh, private notes, right? So this translates into, for example, uh, yeah, I'm not going to focus on it right now, but yeah, if you have a ticket and you're looking at it, it the uh, default is to send an internal note. I hope that makes sense. Render URIs as hyperlinks. This is not used so much, so I don't, I'm not going to cover it. Um, make email comment uh, from CC'd and uh, end user public. So depends. This is depends. Zendesk uh, it doesn't recommend it, but I like it. And it is active here because um, it, I, for example, in this use case that I was uh, trying to demo, um, this customer didn't, uh, didn't had some partners that weren't living in Zendesk. They didn't want to pay accounts for them. And they did want them to be able to reply publicly. So um, if they were added as CCs to a ticket, and then the requester of that ticket was able to see the public comments, which is not ideal in some cases, but in this demo, it was, and um, it was relevant. So let's deactivate it for now, and uh, you can make your own. You can make your own, make up your mind if you want this to be public or not. Attachments so customers can can attach files. Obviously, this is uh, very useful. Um, and you should allow your customers to add, uh, add, um, uh, attach to attach files because yeah, this is so frequent right now that you take a picture of something and then you attach it, and then the agent can directly see what's going on and get back to customers faster. Secure downloads means that end users have to log into the guides in order to see the um, to see the the attachment, and this also means that they have to create an account with you, right? With your Zendesk. So this is um, this is very useful uh, to, to have, but it all depends on how, what your privacy is with your company, for example. Uh, include, include attachments and emails. So this is good, but then again, it can become a little bit frustrating if, for example, each time you reply to some, to, to your customers, each time the, uh, the attachments are going to be carried over in each reply. And that can be sometimes useful, but it can also be not so much, uh, not so, it doesn't necessarily improve the customer experience. So this is again, up to you what to do. Tags, enable tags on tickets. So um, this is what I was talking about, um, which I think is the most important one, right? So enable tags on tickets. So uh, if you disable it, you don't want to add tags to your tickets. So um, this will remove the tag field on the ticket uh, ticket form. However, updates to tags will be sent will be possible via the API. I would just uh, refrain from the allowing your agents to add tags, and that's it. I would allow allow tags on tickets because they are important for business rules. CCs and followers. So enable followers. The difference between followers and CCs is that um, uh, followers are internal teams, right? So if we add a follower to a ticket, we know that they are an agent within Zenesk, even if they are a light agent, but they will still be able to see updates to tickets and uh, yeah, see um, keep an eye out on what is being discussed. 
follower email subject. So yeah, this is uh, customizing the experience for the followers to yeah uh, put uh, the right information for them. Enable CCs. So if you want to enable CC, your customers, uh, enable to uh, your agents to add CCs to tickets, which uh, yeah, CCs are people who are, do not have access to Zenas and they will be able to see public replies. However, um, they can participate or not. And if they reply, you can have the option to make that comment uh, internal or you know that, that the requester doesn't see it or it can be public and then the customer can see it. Enable light agents to become CCs on tickets. Yeah, why not? I want them to see updates on tickets. Enable CCs for end users in health center. So in the health center or guide experience, whenever you, for example, access the form and you submit a request, you have all your forms, um, your you have your forms and you have your ticket fields in the form. And one of those ticket fields is going to be um, the ability to add CCs. So it's going to be add your CCs here. It's just a field where you can add the CCs. Automatically make an agency C follower? Uh, not necessarily. So um, this means that uh, uh, an agent who is um, um, working on a ticket, they will be automatically made a CC, uh, also a follower. It depends if you need it or not. This, usually the more from the agent experience perspective, the more uh, replies you see in your inbox, the more overbearing it becomes. Imagine if you have hundreds of tickets coming in per day and uh, one of your teams is handling it, then you'd be, uh, yes, receiving updates in your inbox each time. And it can be overbearing, so be mindful. Okay, so then the requester, agents can change the requester. Yes, sometimes it is necessary that uh, you change the requester, maybe because you can, for example, realize that uh, whoever is reaching out to you is, um, yeah, is not necessarily the right person to deal with this request, and then you can change the requester. Or maybe somebody is reaching out to you from their secondary email address, which is not registered in your, yeah, in your app or in your backend or, or even in your Zenda, so you just change that to their regular email. So yes, I would advise that. Assignment auto assign tickets on solved. So if I am an agent and I solve a ticket, I automatically become the assignee of that ticket. This is reflective. This reflects in the in the reports afterwards. So it's uh, it's a good idea in my view. Allow reassignment back to the general group. Yes, this is a good feature. If I see, uh, if I have a list of tickets and they were assigned to me and I don't know how to deal with them, I can assign it back to the group. However, there is a downside. It's a double-edged sword because if I am allowed to do this, I am prone to maybe sometimes cherry pick, which is, it's up to you to decide how, uh, how you want to do this. Uh, suspended ticket notifications. So um, this sends a list to a list of the suspended tickets to your inbox, whoever you want. If you want to uh, sus send the, the list of suspended tickets to someone else, so they can check it. Ticket ID. This is just a counter for your uh, for your tickets, and then you can set it to zero when you start, so you can test for all that you want and you can start from and yeah whenever you finish testing you can start from zero or you can try to sound it can look like you're doing you know what you're doing and start from uh, 10k <laughs> but no let's just be honest uh, anyway i'm just not going to change it right now it was 355 the counter email archive email archiving so a copy of all outbound trigger and automation notification will be sent to this email address. So you can have a copy of what was sent to the customers. Um, there is an audit available in Zenisk as well, which does this. So you don't necessarily need to do this, but yeah, it is available. Side conversations. So you can enable email, enable Slack and enable child tickets. So side conversations, as I maybe remember from yesterday lesson, or if you don't, there's a way for you to reach out to your third parties and you can do that via a side conversation on a ticket via email or you can very very nicely use it with slack very works very nice I've tried it looks really cool very modern or child tickets i don't prefer this why because you just add to the backlog child ticket is uh, for example you have uh, a ticket and then you realize that you <clears throat> 
you need to reach out to someone else for uh, to solve that issue and you can just create another ticket uh, and add the requester that person that uh, yeah and you need re you need to be reaching out to but in my view it just adds the backlog and then you have to remember to close that ticket out solve it and i yeah i don't like it to be honest um yeah so that's it this one i'm not going to go over because it's not very used right now so i'm going to save it Alrighty, so going back to here, our next lesson is going to be about uh, email and then the yeah the channel setup and then the email and then the chats and then guide and then oh my god, so many many things to discuss. So this has been uh, con this uh, covers all the lesson all the lessons about uh, ticketing and I hope this was useful. I hope uh, yeah whoever made it this far, you're a champion. I love you. <laughs> You're on your way to doing great things. And um, what else can I tell you? Yeah, I'll see you in the next lesson, I guess. So <laughs> uh, next lesson is about uh, channel setup, which is going to be various lessons around the different channels inside this. So being an omni-channel that it is, yeah, quite a, quite a bit of lessons there too. So lovely to see you again. The, the keyword, if you've seen this video so far, is the blueberry pie. Tell me this uh, keyword blueberry pie and you get a nice discount and also a cupcake. <laughs> so yeah, I'll see you. Uh, bye.